to invite um, Tammy Fox up, and she is going to introduce Mark Quee, who is here in attendance, who's also being honored this evening. All right. Can you tell us to Hello, everybody. Hope you had a good dinner. Um, try to stay awake just a little bit longer. I don't know if it's great food. Um, so, y'all know Mark? You think you know Mark? Give me a few things that might help you get to know Mark just a little bit better. So, I've known of Mark for 10, 15, maybe more years, um, but I've really had the opportunity to start to get to know Mark a little bit better um, through the local. Well, probably since we started about 2010, we kind of hung out a little bit at Andy Young's farm. There was this film crew that stuck um, microphones up our faces while we were trying to avoid all the rain um, to go down in the metal shed. But really, that PFI that winter, we just got together and said, Ugh, we need a little support. We need to help each other out. And so we started, a group of us got together, called, we call ourselves the lovely name, The Gang of Five, otherwise known as The Gang. Um, and we've been getting together six to eight times a year uh, on each other's farms, supporting each other. Um, we work, we support each other and eat. We always eat well. Um, so we celebrate, we support each other for this is the Bell Heritage Farm, Blue Day Farm, Wild Wasabi Farm, Jenny Fox Farm, and of course, Scattered Good Friends Schools Farm. Um, so, in the spirit of camaraderie and support that our gang has done for one another, I reached out and I got ideas from the gang. Um, <laughs> so, this is a gang and effort, Mark. Uh, so, one farm, when asked about Mark, often this. Mark is an avid outdoorsman. He loves backpacking, camping, hiking, and farming. So much so that he seems to have an ability to cultivate the outdoors on his person. Like the time he had a skin infection on his knee from healing, and the time he got Jimson weed in his eye and was told to get to the ER ASAP because one eye was dilated and the other eye wasn't. Fortunately, that was beautiful. Um, and so, in that part of the pain, that deserves to one thing I've learned so much from Mark is how to value collaboration and shared endeavors. So it's no surprise that Mark is so involved with PFI. So you know this quote, get along, but don't go along. Get along. Mark does a lot of that by hosting, we've got a big uh, count of six formal field days. He shares his experiences, he generously opens his farm to help us to learn and how to collaborate. The other part of Mark, though, is his uniqueness. Just move on right quickly to parenting. Um, Mark has a spirit of trying new things, and he's not satisfied with just doing what has been done. Mark has completed 25 different cooperator trials. He's um, anything ranging from tillage radish to control weeds and horticulture crops to variety trials that include summer broccoli, bell pepper varieties, and cauliflower varieties, and a whole more. Get along, but don't go along. Don't go along. Mark is wonderful at trying something new in farming and his off time. If you know Mark in the summer, or spring, or fall, or maybe even winter, you know about the tacos. I went, huh, he's got them. Mark is not one to be hit by bloody heavy footwear. He favors most of the years, I maybe mean, when there's snow and sub zero weather. He favors the open sub shoe look. Um, it doesn't matter if there are thistle, if there are bees, it doesn't matter if there's mud. Mark is generally comfortable outside in those conditions. Um, According to another member of our group, Mark has other areas of uniqueness, including that he's hiked the entire Indy Appalachian Trail. He rode his bike in a big circle around the U.S. and Canada. He still goes backpacking almost every year in the Wind River Range, even when he has Ionic Hill. We know that in addition to running scattered farms, Mark also teaches. I was reminded by yet another one of our group. 
um, that one of her, her favorite things about Mark is that it's the spirit of not going along. Mark has recently been teaching a zombie class. <laughs> Talk about not going along, Mark. Mark, on behalf of the Gang of Five, Craft Farmers of Iowa, and all of us here, thank you for your dedication to learning and trying to be best. Congratulations. That was a lot, and uh, thank you. It feels great to be up here. Uh, Stefan asked me to put together some remarks um, about my life as a researcher in the cooperators program, and, uh, and I'm sorry, but this is what I came up with instead. So, uh, <laughs> What I was really curious about is how Stefan's going to react to my words tonight. So um, my very first uh, PFI cooperators research trial was in 2009 when we looked at the weed suppression capacity of tillage radish in an organic vegetable system. Results on weed suppression were inconclusive, but as often happens, there were unexpected findings or at least observations. Uh, the soil til tilth and texture impressed me so much I assumed I had discovered the next great innovation in food production, letting tillage radish literally do the tilling for us. And then black rot set in and disrupted our brassica production for a season or two. Sort of was a theme of the, the HORT program this afternoon. Our most recent trials from the last season, 10 years after that first trial, were a variety trial on cauliflower, which, provided, which proved frustrating because of the wet spring and general climate weirdness. We also did a trial looking at vine borer control and winter squash, in this case, blue hubbards, since they are most susceptible to vine borer. And the results were that Blue Hubbard squash are indeed very susceptible to vine borers. <laughs> and between that early trial and these most recent ones, I've researched cover crops every which way, have done a half dozen variety trials, looked at insect controls, weed controls, transitioning pastures to vegetables, grazing vegetable plots with sheep, mycorrhizal fungi inoculations, and some trials I'm forgetting. And I'm convinced, oh my gosh, I've been forgetting a slideshow. Sorry, we'll start there. This is, the, uh, this is the first trial. This was the radishes, they're beautiful. And then this is uh, from this last year. So let me start over here. Um, I'm convinced that the contribution that has had the greatest impact on other growers is not how I use cover crops or the various uh, mulches or variety recommendations, but is instead the practice of using zinnias as field flags, <laughs> filling out end rows, separating varieties, differenti differentiating successions, and most, mostly simply making the land we farm a more beautiful place to work and visit. That's really true. Like everybody who comes to our farm says that that's the thing that they're going to take back to their farm. So the farm, I work at Scattergood Friends School, which is a uh, small uh, boarding and day high school that is owned by the Iowa Yearly Meeting of Friends, commonly known as Quakers. We try to grow as much food for ourselves as possible, which includes all the meat we eat year-round. So we raise pork, beef, lamb, and turkey, and then most of the vegetables from August to November, with beets, cabbage, squash, turnips, onions, sweet potatoes, and carrots stored away to feed us through spring. Um, I'm a teacher. Uh, I don't teach biolo biology, as you might expect. Instead, I'm an English language arts teacher, or we call it Scattergood Humanities. And um, today, I did miss my, my zombies class. Um, <laughs> I had to find a substitute. And uh, it's a real class. And what we do is we consider the various monsters that have been created by our cultural fears. And we consider them critically. We think about them hard. And then we do a lot of writing and discussion. It's a serious class. Um, However, one mantra that I've had to employ frequently is we watch a lot of films, so how do we have a, a great discussion about a really bad movie? And then we do. Uh, tomorrow I'll miss my 10th grade writing class. We call it sophomore seminar. My goal is to get the students to think of themselves as writers, so we just come in and write. I start with a six-week unit in which each student selects an object and then writes about it, sometimes directly, but most often tangentially. We do that twice a week for six weeks, just writing about a single object. 
The very first lesson, we listened to an On Being interview with Marie Howe, who is the former Poet Laureate of New York State. And then we practiced writing without metaphor. For instance, we would um, say, like, blue napkins on a white tablecloth. Just very descriptive, just, just trying to hone our observational skills. Yellow walls with a gray divider. And we just practiced that over and over and over again uh, for two classes. And then after that, um, we move on to a string of imitations. So I bring in William Carlos Williams, Sandra Cisneros, Kay Gibbons, John Keats. Um, I bring in short writings, we discuss them briefly, and then we just write. Uh, the Keats prompt is right after we've spent most of two classes writing about metaphor, without metaphor, and then we leap right into this British romantic poet writing an ode about a Grecian urn in 1819, admiring a tangible object, yet thinking profound thoughts on beauty, on love, on mortality, and on life. Surface observation leads to deeper understanding and then contemplation. So that's my sophomore seminar class. That's tomorrow. I'll be missing that too. But we just come in, we write, we share, and eventually, I hope we all start to consider ourselves writers. Um, another prompt I'll bring to class is a collection of books. I just kind of pull books off my shelf at home, and I just open them at random, uh, fiction or poetry. Uh, I just select a sentence, and then that becomes the first sentence of our current writing project. Um, sometimes it's hit or miss. It's hard to find a good sentence you know, on the spur of the moment. But if, it's a, if it misses, I just move right on to another one. So we write about 10 minutes and then move on. Um, in doing the poetry, there's one poem, this one that you're looking at now, that I don't choose randomly. I choose it intentionally. And that, of course, is Wendell Berry's The Piece of Wild Things. And, um, and I only read up until the first comma. And then that becomes the first sentence for the student's writing. So that's when despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. Stop there. And then the students will continue and address their despair and hopefully their remedies, which is what Barry leaves us with. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forth out of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time. I rest in the grace of the world and am free. In the, if those in this room, if the people in this room represent the genres of Wendell Berry, I think many of you would probably represent his essays. You're very intellectual, erudite, uh, you have an argument to make, often about the failings of industrial agriculture. I think Berry writes with a thoughtful confidence that many cooperators also share. Um, if people would just do those things that we've done, Life would be better, we had questions, we answered them, listen to us, do these things that we wanna do. Help me get my slideshow back. Um, so it's mostly just like, please listen to us. I have a confession to make, I actually haven't read any Wendell Berry poems or essays for about 20 years. Um, I really think I should. But I find that there's always so, much, so many other things to read. But I do read his poems every year. Um, that's the advantage of being a teacher, is that it forces me you know, into these habits of reading poetry. I do think that there are a lot of people in this room, too, people who have inspired me, um, that would also represent Barry's poems. And these are people who are full of grace, beauty, love, alarm, anger, and sadness. I'm not sure who, probably all of us, would represent Barry's fiction because we love the places that we work and live and we care deeply about them. When I think about my progress as a farmer and a person, as a PFI cooperator, I think that I've followed this trend line from being more like his essays to more like his poetry. I used to think that I had more answers than I do now. Now I'm more consent, content to say simply, taste this, appreciate this, and wonder at all this. In my essay phase of life and farming, I focused on production. We had to feed the students, supply the CSA, fill the invoice for the new Pioneer Co-op. And now, it's as likely I consider a crop failure to be the flowers I mistimed the bloom period or the Canada thistles in the insectary strip. I focus much more on beauty, 
believing that production can be a result of beauty and that beauty too is a valuable product. Considering these two genres, poetry and essays, I think the problem with the essay approach, if our goal is shifting the dominant agricultural paradigm, which I think certainly needs to change, and I think many people in this room would agree, is that unfortunately there are too many other people in the world writing their own compelling essays with recommendations and results that are the opposite of our own. And it seems that for whatever reason, their arguments are winning. I think. We're seeing that in cover crops and conventional systems. We feel that we have the answer, cover crops work, and yet the adoption rate is appallingly slow. 4% in Iowa, what, is that right, Sarah? 4%? Like, why is that? Somehow, somewhere, another essay is being written. Another argument is too often winning. And that argument is just keep doing what you're doing. Keep your fields clean and everything of everything except for corn and soybeans. So I said I work at a Quaker institution. Quakers believe in this idea of a capital T truth, that truth exists apart from us. We gather together and seek that truth, but it exists. It is a thing that can eventually emerge for us. Uh, in Quaker decision-making process, the weighty decisions are often arrived at through consensus, which can be slow, arduous, taken as much inward looking as outward. But the goal is to end up with a truth for any situation. Quakers can spend a long time discerning, contending, and listening. The key, though, is that the process is punctuated with worshipful silence. Just as some musicians describe music as the silence that happens between the notes, Quaker decision-making can be described as the silence between the messages, or for the sake of this speech, the poems between the essays. To me, this process is altogether a prayer. I sometimes worry that perhaps the capital T truth that PFI and its cooperators have to offer will never be discerned by the majority or achieve great acceptance. There are just too many voices, all making seemingly compelling arguments, selling a product, a system, an approach to living or farming that can make a certain sense to people. Apply this much nitrogen, till those fields in the fall, use those herbicides, use these seed genetics, these treatments, can find this many animals in this much space. The arguments must be compelling because surface water contamination, Gulf of Mexico dead zones, beneficial insect die-offs, and depopulate, depopulated landscapes are all real things that either are considered acceptable costs of production or are just ignored completely. I'm not sure crafting a better essay is going to reverse this. Which brings me back here. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. Indeed, that is a truth I live with and I suspect many of us also live this truth, that there is plenty to fear, especially for our children's lives and their children's lives, but our poem can't end there. Instead, we need to peacefully farm in the presence of wild things like foxes and fungi and bobolinks and bumblebees. How many in this room consider themselves scientists? Great. I think, yeah, a lot of us, most of us. How many people also think of themselves as artists? Great. Excellent. What has taken me 20 years, and I don't know why, but finally, I view the land I work as a canvas that creates anew every year, something hopefully that speaks to the heart. I can't hold the land, but it holds my imagination, as I'm sure the land you work holds your imagination. Make it your canvas, your song, your poem, or your prayer. 200 years ago, John Keats held that urn, and the urn held him. Keats is gone now, but the poem remains. Keats saw love and life, but knew that for him neither could last. He knew that the art he held, even the art he was creating, would outlive him and all those he knew. His poem ends like this, with the poet addressing the pot, which is, of course, a product of land and potter. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, 
in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. So just as I hope that my sophomores start to see themselves as writers, I hope that all the cooperators in this room will also start to see themselves as artists, as poets, as musicians, as lovers of beauty and truth. Let's farm in the presence of wild things. Let's embrace the poetry of the places we inhabit. Let's keep seeking answers to all the important questions while also planting flowers for ourselves and the world. Thanks. <laughs>